Can anyone hear me online now? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. I think you can. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So sorry about this shuffle. We moved to a different room. Uh, maybe that wasn't necessary because we have a <laughs> number of people here and a number of people over there. There's a lot of competing sessions right now. Um, but thanks for joining the, the session today. Um, we're going to be talking a bit about artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, how those kind of work in the DHS2 ecosystem. Um, we have a few presenters who are going to share some uh, ANML as well as data science, just advanced analytics. Um, but I'm going to do a, a quick intro on AI and ML um, and talk a little bit about how that can apply to DHS2 and the, the areas where we work. Uh, and then we'll have a few presenters who will share. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end of the session as well for some questions uh, and maybe ideas as well, because it's a very uh, quickly changing field with lots of things that are happening. So it, I'm very excited to, to see where this will take us. Um, this has no significance other than that it's a very cute picture that an AI drew. Um, <laughs> all right. so. What are the opportunities for AI and machine learning uh, in DHIS2? So before I uh, move to the next slide where I have a few, a few possible answers to this question, um, do we have any uh, ideas uh, in the audience? I don't know if we can share uh, um, this or I'll just repeat what you say. So did any, anyone in the audience or on online have an idea of what, uh, what would be a good way to use AI or machine learning, or even not not necessarily, but data science and advanced analytics in DHIS2? Any any show of hands? Any ideas? Lars, data forecasting. Very good. Any others? Other ideas? Yeah. Interpretation of data points, maybe interpretation of visualizations, or being able to kind of not just show somebody something visually, but tell them what's interesting about what they're looking at. Could be a very interesting use of, of language learning models. Lars has a lot of ideas. <laughs> Anomaly detection, that's a good one. Any others, do we have any online? Feel free to put it in the chat if you do. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I, I, it was a little hard to hear. Yes, tuberculosis. X-rays, uh, yeah, X-ray interpretation for, for tuberculosis detection, absolutely. The image, yeah, image analysis, that's another good one. Okay, so there are, there are a few ideas here. Um, let's see what ChatGPT says. Um, <laughs> so I actually asked ChatGPT this question. And I came up with some pretty good answers. They're not perfect. Uh, some of them we've already, we've already heard here today. Um, but you can all follow this link when I when I share the slides as well. So I first just ask, how can AI and machine learning be used in DHIS2? And we have some data quality and cleaning. So that uh, goes along with anomaly detection, which is also down here. We have predictive analytics, which is forecasting. We have uh, decision support, which uh, maybe is, is similar to uh, uh, interpretation of visualizations, but we actually also have that one down here as well. So data visualization and exploration. Um, and yeah, a number of other things here. And then I, I went on and I asked it, all right, what about in the, the software development process of DHIS2? How could we apply artificial intelligence or chat GPT or language learning, large learning models? Um, and there's some good ones here. So data pre-processing, um, how do we, uh, that one, I'm not entirely sure if it knows what it's talking about, but that's okay. <laughs> um, automated testing is a very big one that I think is a, very much worth exploring. So making sure that that software is robust we don't have regressions that's something that uh, humans are not that great at right you can throw a lot of of human power at it but it takes a lot of time and you're going to miss some things whereas a machine is very good at figuring out all of the possible paths for something um obviously code optimization documentation generation is a very good one so being able to say all right we know what this does now let's describe it and let's have help people to figure out what's going on obviously bug detection and resolution. Uh, and then I went on and asked it again, all right, so what about user training or documentation and support? And we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about this later. Um, so user training is, is something that chatbots or um, 
uh, virtual assistants could be very helpful for uh, contextual documentation. I think this is actually, uh, and, and Eirik might talk a little bit about this later, but I think this is a, a huge area of um, uh, opportunity where we have generic documentation and we have very configurable DHS2 systems that are maybe difficult to kind of, for an end user especially, to take the generic documentation and their specific configuration and put those together and figure out how to do what they want with the configuration of their system. And so if you can then take that documentation and contextualize it to what their use case is or how their system is configured and present that to them, that could be very, very useful. And also do that in, a, in an interactive way so that they don't have to uh, search through a, a huge document to find what they're looking for, but they can ask the question that they want. Troubleshooting and support. Um, recommendations, uh, I think, is a, is a good one as well. Another one that didn't come up here, but I think is uh, worth worth exploring as well, is um, being able to do intelligent mapping of different uh, configurations or different uh, metadata in different systems and automatically try to figure out how you uh, use something in one system that's called something slightly different than, than another one. We had a presentation from uh, uh, Pete Linnigan from BAO Systems the other day who used a pretty lightweight but a, a model to say within a certain threshold let's find names of different data elements in two different systems that are similar but not exactly the same and suggest that those that mapping should exist so if it's called um, I don't know, ANC in one, and it's called antenatal care in the other, it can say that those are probably pretty similar, um, uh, even though it's not an automatic mapping. So this is basically all to say that there's a lot of opportunity here. Uh, obviously, some of it is hype, and we're not just going to throw uh, everything out uh, immediately and, and jump on AI, the AI train. But I think there, especially with the recent developments in AI, machine learning, uh, advanced analytics, we didn't talk about as much here, but um, there's a lot of opportunity there to really uh, supplement and support the, the processes that people are using DHIS to, to, to work on. So with that, that's, that's all of my intro. Um, I just wanted to give kind of a, a fun little uh, dive into ChatGPT. We could explore this a little bit more and uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll let uh, oh wait I have to log in with my account that's over there I'll do that another time um so maybe if you can think about the next question to ask kind of beyond this maybe to dive into one of these specifically we can ask that at the end if we have some time um, but with that I think I'll turn it over to our first speaker who's from solid lines um who's going to present a bit about uh data science or, or, or uh, advanced analytics uh, with DHS2 data um, and then we'll talk uh, a bit more about machine learning and artificial intelligence in the following presentations as well. Thank you. All right. Um, I hope the people online can hear me. Uh, so I'm going to be presenting an integrated architecture for adding analytical power. My name is Socorro Lopez and I'm from Solid Lines. Um, so we won't be speaking too much about ML and AI applications, but more of an architectural approach that can allow you to do this type of analysis. Um, but first thing first on the agenda, it said that Carlos Tejo would be presenting this. He's one of our lead software architects. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it. I'm presenting on his behalf. I'm a data analyst and BI specialist at Solid Lines. So I will do my best to try to answer your technical questions afterwards, but I may have to send some of those his way after the presentation. Um, so a little bit about us. Um, we are a small digital consulting company based in Spain, and we do a lot of different projects from server management to DHIS2 implementation. Um, we have 15 plus years of experience working across 25 different countries. Um, but recently, we've really been interested in looking at building analytic platforms, helping organizations build their analytic platforms. So today, we're going to look at um, some of the DHIS2 analytic cap capabilities what it looks like to scale that architecture and the strengths of that architecture, and then some use cases from some of the partners that we work with. So first, DHIS2, um, there is a lot of analytic capabilities in there, as you guys know, and the functionality is improving with each release. And what we've seen with a lot of our partners is that most of their use, use cases could be um, 
achieve through DHIS2. I had one partner come to me and say, oh, I want to help. I want you to help me with this Power BI report, only to spend many hours figuring out we could have done it all in DHIS2. So we want to prevent that. Um, and the key takeaway there is that you should have a really strong use case if you're going to pull that data out of DHIS2 and visualize it in a BI tool. Um, and usually it's uh, DHIS2 is the best option when you do have all of your data in one DHIS2 instance. But there are those use cases that have really pushed the boundaries of what's possible with DHIS2 in terms of analytics. So some of the things that we've seen is people want to build those elaborate dashboards for their donors or a public facing dashboard. Maybe they have really massive data sets or they're trying to do an analysis of complex indicators and heavy data transformations. They may want to combine data from multiple DHIS2 instances. And often they want to triangulate their data with external data sources or unstructured data sources. So this can range from chatbot, free text conversations, to weather, con weather conditions, to system blogs. So what does it look like when you want to scale that architecture? So as I said, a lot of the things that people want to do can be done in the dashboards and the visualizations. But sometimes people need to pull that data into a BI tool for more elaborate visualizations and complex analytics needs. So when you need to do more complex transformations, and then a benefit of that is you're able to pull in other data sources. However, there are limitations to this approach of importing data directly from DHIS2 into the BI tool. And when that's the case, then you, the organization may want to consider integrating a data repository. And this is for more advanced com complex analytic needs. Um, so your data repository is comprised of data lakes and a common data warehouse, which we'll delve into in a bit. Um, but first, let's talk a little bit about the difference between pulling it directly into a BI tool vers versus using this data warehouse solution. So a BI tool, you would go through these various steps to do some kind of data analysis and then facilitate data use. Um, and you can do this with an array of tools, right? We had a, a presentation on Superset yesterday. There's Tableau, Power BI. However, when you have these more advanced analytic use cases, then you may want to consider using this data repository for the first two steps. So to connect and transform the data and model the data. Um, and a key point here is that even if you use this data repository, you're still going to have to pull that data into the BI tool to visualize it and share it with your data users. Um, but if you do decide, if the organization decides that they want to implement this integrated analytics system, um, it can be done on premise or using cloud computing platforms like Azure and AWS. If you do it on premise, it is a lot of work and it's quite expensive. Within our own implementations at SolidLines, we are using um, cloud platforms. So that's what I'll be speaking to mostly throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, so as you saw in this slide, both BI tools and the data repository can do similar things, right? They can both connect and transform the data and model the data. So why would you choose to incorporate a data repository? And there's several reasons. The first that we've seen um, quite a few times is that when you have people pulling a lot of DHIS2 data, a lot of API calls really often, it could stress the server, which you really want to avoid if you have a large DHIS2 instance across multiple countries where there's a lot of users. Um, it also allows you to rapidly access huge amounts of data. It reduces the dependency on the availability of data sources. So for example, things like Facebook, they'll prevent you from pulling historical data like five years in the past. If you have it in a data warehouse, it's going to be in there for you to analyze until you remove it. It also provides the point of truth for multiple users, like especially around your common dimensions. So what we mean by this is for data sets that people are using often in analysis, like your org units, it can be in your data warehouse and people can pull that over and over and over again, and they don't need to do the transformations themselves. Um, it also structures data in a way that makes it easy for BI tools to analyze. And you can do this with any BI tool, right? Like open source BI tools, commercial BI tools. And lastly, it really helps organizations scale. So with regards to the cloud platform, 
Scalability is related to being able to store and manip manipulate significant amount of data from any source, uh, structured or unstructured. But the cloud platform also a lot, uh, facilitates with transparency and consistency. So you have core data consistency for those common dimensions, like maybe your org unit tree or a calendar table. Um, you also have a collaborative approach to data transformation. So for that final integrated data set, it's very easy to see what transformations took place to get to that final data set. Also, it facilitates data security, so your data is distributed, distributed across multiple nodes. Um, and then if, if there's ever failures, you can store those failures for further analysis. And there's ways to uh, do safeguards for restricting sensitive data and, and PII. And it's cost effective, especially when you end up having huge amount of data, the, low, the storage cost is quite low. Um, and it eliminates silo costs in the sense that people aren't performing the same transformations over and over. One person can do the transformations and store in the, dish, in the DWH, and then it's there for all of your analysts to pull into their, P, their BI reports. So what does this architecture look like? Um, so first you have your data sources, and those sources are extract, the raw data is extracted through a pipeline into the repository, the data lake repository. The data lake repository has three data lakes. This is typically the best uh, practice for the infrastructure. The first is a raw data lake, and that's where you have your data that is in its original format. Then you have a curated data lake, and that's where you have the data that has undergone transformations. And it's also where you can remove sensitive information in PII so that users cannot access that later in the warehouse. And finally, you have a staging data lake. So that's where your data is stored and it's an analytic sandbox where your data scientists can use that data to perform deep data analysis. So then you can store those integrated data sets um, into a data warehouse, which we call DWH often. And again, that's done through a pipeline that's pushing those data sets into the DWH. And the DWH provides the structure for that data. So usually this is done through dimensional data modeling. Once you have that data modeling, that data can be, can be fed into a BI tool to visualize it. So what types of data do we see being put into these tools or uh, into this repository? So most often it's chatbot data, social media data, like rapid pro, demographics, weather conditions, server logs, free text conversations. This can range from like comments on YouTube to Facebook Messenger. Um, there's also a lot of data from databases themselves. So DHS2, Fire, Moodle, Matmo, all kinds of things. Possibilities are really endless. Um, so we're gonna look at a couple use cases from one of our biggest partners, Population Services International. This is from a project called DISC, and they're pulling data from over 30 countries and multiple data sources. So chatbots, social media, fire system logs. And in this particular part of their Power BI report, they're looking at ways that they can um, facilitate follow-up for people who are doing self-care self in reproductive health. This is another example where they are pulling data from multiple DHIS2 instances to look at um, health quality care within the private sector across many countries. So once um, you have this architecture in place, how would an organization engage with it? Uh, so in your data lake repository, this is where you, your data engineer is typically configuring the system. So the structure of the data lakes, the DWH, configuring the pipelines that really make it all work. Um, then your data scientists would typically be doing the da big data and deep data analysis within the data, data lake repository, where you have all that unstructured data. Uh, within the data warehouse, your data analyst is querying that routine data, but they're also using it to develop reports within Power BI, so that hopefully eventually the data users can um, use it to gain insights and make informed decisions. So what is driving the analytical power be uh, behind this type of architectural approach? And in our opinion, it's two key things. The first is the design principles behind the architecture. So um, first that data lake structure where you have three different data lakes for your raw data, your curated data and your staging data. 
Uh, second is common dimensions and dimensional data modeling, which we didn't get to go into too much, but it's one of my favorite topics. So if you have more questions, come up after. I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, and then reusability. So in terms of the architecture, the pipelines that are built can be reused, but also reusability in terms of getting the data over and over from the data warehouse because it's there for multiple data users to use. And then on the technology side, we have Hadoop, so HDFS, and this is a highly fault tolerant um, distributed file system and Spark, uh, which provides the computational power for transformations over large distributed data sets. And both of these are open source. So um, for our final use case, we'll look at analytic usage analytics. And this is also from PSI. Uh, so they were interested in understanding how people are navigating the system, how, visualize it, how visualizations are being accessed and whether the dashboards are really being used. And there are capabilities within DHIS2 that allow you to analyze favorite views and top favorites. However, if you pull the system log data into a data repository using the data lake and um, DWH approach, it gives you much more dynamic analysis capabilities, a lot more flexibility in what you can actually analyze. So um, the possibilities are really endless. You can look at things like API endpoints used, the latency times, the dev devices and browsers that are accessing the system, conflicts and errors during, during synchronization. Um, so what would this look like in practice? Uh, the data is being pushed to the data lake where it's stored in a file system and you can push that data as often as possible. You set that schedule. In this case, it's being pushed on a daily basis the log data. This is what the raw data looks like in the raw data lake. Um, then it goes through the other two data lakes. So it gets curated and put into the staging lake. Um, and then it's modeled in the DWH. And this is what the model looks like once it's brought into, into Power BI or the BI tool. So once you have those, tra those core transformations and the modeling, you can end up with reports that give you some um, very intricate and detailed uh, analytics. So for example, you can understand the number of the users in the system, the size of the data, the number of API calls. Um, you can look at how many calls were successful versus how many failed. And you can also get a better sense of who is accessing the system, uh, how often they're accessing it. You can even go as granular as seeing which dashboards, which visualizations they're looking at. So um, key takeaways from this presentation, uh, this architectural approach is definitely an investment in terms of time and res resources. And it requires buy-in at the leadership level. This is not a project-based approach. You really need to do this at the organizational level. Um, but as organizations' data size and complexity increases, you really need to think about the limitations of connecting the tool directly to uh, your BI, BI tool, the data directly to your BI tool. Um, for the architecture, it can be on-premise or in the cloud, but cloud solutions typically provide um, better functionality for scaling and security. And um, in terms of the, the powerful aspects of this architecture, it's driven by the data lakes in DWH, which facilitate scalability and data processing um, be, because they provide high availability, data availability and fault tolerance. Um, but, and you can also have really powerful analysis of the data, but you have to make sure that it's uh, properly modeled. So thank you so much. Yeah, we will. Um, okay. So is it next? Does anyone have a quick question while we while we switch uh, switch speakers? Great presentation. Thank you. I'll I'll repeat your question. Which one do you have to take uh, and which one do you go? 
Did you, did you hear the question? No. So I'm, I'm going to repeat it for those online as well. Um, I'm actually going to have you repeat it. So that I don't, so that I don't misinterpret what you said. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, since you are taking pulling data from different sources, if you have the same data, say from the population data from two different sources or stock data or something, then how do you reconcile which uh, is is uh, which uh, data to take and which to ignore? So you're saying that if you had um, popul two two different data sets that are both around population data and you have to decide sources. Uh, I think that would really be dependent on like the organization and what they decide is the most credible data source, for example, um, or what's the most appropriate for their use case. Like maybe what's the granularity of the data set um, and is that useful for what they want to end up visualizing in the end. So credibility and then aspects that influence how you could apply that data, like how, how granular the data is. So basically the data analyst will make the choice and uh, which data to, to choose if it is coming from multiple sources. Yeah, so I think from our implementations, typically like we would have a discovery phase where you look at the various data sources and you try to understand um, how that data can be pulled into the system and how it would be visualized. But Typically, at least in my opinion, um, you always want to understand like what the end goal is and what actually needs to be visualized based off of user needs. So when they're looking at that data, what kind of actions are they supposed to be taking? And then that should really drive what what data source you choose, right? Because the data source needs to be able to provide that kind of functionality for them to make informed decisions at the end of the process. May I? Go ahead. Yeah, hi, there. Sean Broomhead from his South Africa. So, so really just a comment. I wanted to say thanks very much. This is fantastic. Um, we as an organization prioritized data science about two, three years ago. And if we had seen this presentation then, it would have been incredibly helpful. So I think anybody that's wanting to go down this journey, this is a fantastic cheat sheet. And we spent a lot of time learning lessons, which uh, we would have saved if we'd seen this presentation. So thank you very much. Um, and those who want to see what we've done, we've done a production level national uh, system that, that uses machine learning to predict staff attrition uh, in South Africa, which we're presenting in the next session. Very cool. Thank you. Um, I think we do have to move on to the next speaker, unfortunately. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> but we did have one uh, question in the back, so maybe you could uh, talk to him after. But yes, we'll move on now to uh, yeah, Kayla who is going to talk to us about uh, application of machine learning with low code. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I wanna thank the last speaker as well. I think that that was a great presentation and something that we're also struggling with and um, hoping to improve upon in the future. And it's very relevant to what I'm talking about. So um, as mentioned, I'm going to talk about an approach that we are using for machine learning with our DHIS2 tracker data. And I'm a technical advisor in health informatics and data science at FHI 360, where I work on a large HIV project. So Austin kind of stole my thunder. Um, I also asked ChatGPT some questions. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm wondering uh, who's all used ChatGPT before? Yeah, a lot of people. Um, I think AI tools are becoming more and more available and um, something that I hear people, especially people working in analytics uh, say often is, oh, AI is going to take our jobs. So um, I thought I would test that hypothesis and ask ChatGPT to uh, write me a little intro to my presentation. And what I came up with was actually a knock-knock joke. <laughs> so um, I'm going to tell the first AI-generated DHIS2 knock-knock joke. Um, so please, please help me out if you know the familiar or the format of knock-knock jokes. So knock-knock, <laughs> tracker, 
tracker capture your attention. DHIS2 is here to help you track and manage your health data. <laughs> so I hear some clapping, but not necessarily a lot of laughing. Um, I would argue that this is not a very good joke. Um, and I included this because I think it's an example of the limitations of AI. And I think if you take away one thing from this presentation, it's that while we can automate machine learning, the most important part of the process is everything else that goes into it, right? We still need to collect our data, clean our data, format our data, as the last presenter mentioned, in a in a way that can be analyzed using machine learning. And then we need to take the results of that model and apply it to something that actually matters. So um, I would argue that the automated machine learning part that I'm talking about is really a very small piece of the puzzle. So with that context, let me go a little bit into our approach. So in general, this is the supervised learning process. Um, if you're familiar with machine learning, um, we start with data acquisition. So we get data from the source and try to understand our data. Next, we do data cleaning and something that's called feature engineering, but it's essentially looking at what parts of our data set are we going to use to try to predict our outcome. We do the actual modeling. And then we deploy that model to new data um, and put it in the hands of the people making the decisions based on that prediction. So the way that we're doing this is with a combination of DHIS2 and some available uh, software through the Microsoft Power BI platform. And um, I'm going to give you a demo of this. Uh, I have some more detailed slides, but I don't think I have enough time um, to talk through all of them. So if you're interested in more information, feel free to reach out to me. But um, I'm going to give you kind of a practical application of how we're using this. Um, so this is one of the use cases we're looking at, HIV in Lesotho. So Lesotho is a country in Southern Africa, and it's estimated that around 290,000 people live with HIV in Lesotho. It's uh, thought to have the highest prevalence of adult HIV in the world. So we run a community-based project in Lesotho in 12 community councils, and we work with uh, participants who are at high risk of acquiring HIV, female sex workers, men who have sex with men, transgender people, and priority populations. So we collect data in Lesotho um, for our community-based project using DHIS2 Tracker. And this is just an example from a mobile phone of uh, the kind of information that we collect. You'll see we have a number of program stages and many of the stages are collected by different people. So when a client is reached by our project, they first get a risk assessment from a peer educator. They're then offered HIV testing services and an HTS lay counselor um, provides those services. If they test positive, they work with a peer navigator for treatment. And if they're interested in prevention via pre-exposure prophylaxis, they work with a prep nurse. So all of these different um, stakeholders use our system to collect data. We've been using the system since around, um, I think 2021, but we actually back entered data. So we have about three years of data in the system right now. So why did we want to use machine learning in this context? I think some of you are probably familiar with the 95, 95, 95 goals, which is quite a mouthful. But essentially, um, they're global goals where we're looking at um, trying to ensure that 95% of people living with HIV know their status, 95% of people are on treatment, and then 95% of those are virally suppressed. And this is what that looks like for, um, for Lesotho. They're actually doing a fairly good job. So we wanted to look at, can we use machine learning to prioritize HIV testing and reach the undiagnosed? So we're using this really with a subset of our population, um, or this is, the, the thought is to look at people who we've reached but haven't been tested for a number of different reasons. And uh, ideally we would follow up with all of them, counsel them, 
and try to get them to come in for testing. But if we don't have the resources to do that, how can we prioritize that um, time intensive follow up to those most at risk of um, being positive? So now I'm going to give a quick demo. I hope this works. <clears throat> okay. So um, I just want to highlight some of the features of the approach that we're using. So um, we do not have a data lake that's bringing all our data into the model. Um, that would be great. But uh, instead, we're going directly to a BI platform. Um, so this is Power Query in uh, Power BI data flows. And I just wanted to point out, so this is this is our data model, and I'm not going to go into all of it, but we've parameterized the model. So what that means is that you can just change this information about uh, in the system, and then you can refresh the model and bring in data from any DHIS2 instance. Um, from from a program. So uh, we work in, do you say 35? Um, we work in very many countries. I think we have 18 countries with DHIS2 trackers right now. So we wanted to make an approach that we could replicate. I think a lot of you probably know it's sometimes very challenging to get data out of DHIS2. Um, so we parameterized this model um, so that we could easily replicate it across countries. So um, once you save your data model, this is kind of what the, the system looks like. And I just want to show you how easy it is to apply this auto machine learning. So you just go to machine learning models right here, and you can see that I already have a trained model here. But if I wanted to add a new model, I just press that add ML model. I choose the table that I want, and then my outcome. So I have a lot of data here but I'll scroll down to the bottom Oops. and choose test result, and then press next. All right, there's a trying to get to my next tab. Okay, so once you press next, it actually takes a minute to load because it's analyzing what that column contains, but um, it gives you options for the kind of model you can run. So you'll see regression is grayed out here, it's because it knows that this is not numeric data and not appropriate for regression modeling. So um, I'm just going to choose binary prediction. And it has you choose your target outcome. So I know that the um, the results I'm, I want the system to predict is positive, and that's how it's stored in my data set. And then it just has you specify a match label and a mismatch label. So instead of not positive, I'm just going to put negative because everyone who's not positive in our data set has tested negative. And then this is really the important part. It allows you to select which features you'd like to use to try to predict your outcome. So again, it's it's not a magic system that can automatically understand everything about your data. This is where the human element really comes in. So um, I'm not going to train this model right now. Let me just, I'll just select like one thing. So the last thing that you have to do is give your model a name and then select a training time. You can um, have the model train itself for up to six hours. Um, I've tried that before, it never actually takes six hours. Um, maybe if you have more data, it would. But um, after you press save and train there, you, and I think this is one of the really powerful parts about um, AutoML, is that it gives you this really great training report. So it's going to give you some basic model performance statistics, a confusion matrix, which I won't go into any statistics here, but um, you can see visually what your top predictors of your outcome are. If it loads, and then you can actually dig down and get more information about each of your predictors, which is uh, really helpful in terms of understanding how the model is making its calculations. 
You're also able to fine tune your probability threshold. So again, I promise not to go into statistics, but this is incredibly important um, when, depending on what kind of outcome you're looking at. So since uh, testing HIV positive is a fairly rare outcome, um, we want to, and but we don't want to miss anyone. We want to ensure our recall is quite high. So we're able to identify everyone who is positive with our results. So um, again, I'm happy to go into more information for anyone uh, who is interested, but I'm cognizant of time. So I'm just briefly going to go through some results. So we applied the model with a probability threshold of 0.35 to around 8,000 people reached by the EPIC project. And it predicted that a subset of them could be positive. Um, we haven't fully tested all of this yet, but we've reached a subset of the population identified by the model, and we were able to identify new positives at a higher rate than our regular testing. And we were able to identify some new positives, which I think in any case um, means that this was a successful pilot. So um, there are a number of limitations to this approach. Uh, I could talk for this about limitations just for 15 minutes, but um, there's limited ability to fine tune the model. Um, changes in the model take significant time. Power query, while very powerful, is also very slow um, in some cases. And it's difficult to replicate the model via program rules. So um, Power BI or AutoML gives you a lot of details about how the model is made. And it's uh, it's actually based on scikit-learn. So it, it could be replicated in Python, but it's not simple enough to replicate directly in a DHIS2 program. Um, so just back to ChatGPT briefly. Um, I wanted it to give it a chance to redeem itself because it jo its joke was not very good. So I asked it to write an ending to my presentation and I actually kind of liked it. So I thought I would read it here to finish us off. So it said, in conclusion, the combination of Power BI, Microsoft AutoML and DHIS2 Tracker can enable advanced analytics with minimal coding. While automatic automation plays a role, our human understanding of data sources, systems, contexts, and model evaluation remains essential. Let's embrace these tools, harness the power of human intelligence alongside machine learning, and unlock new realms of innovation. Thank you for joining me today, and may your data-driven journey be filled with endless possibilities. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Kayla. I think the the point that you made a couple times is is really essential that your predictions or your analysis is only as good as the data that you're basing it on. And you really need to that that is not an automated process to make sure that you have quality data. Um, you can use automation to help with it, but it's still it's still a very human process and and making sure that you are training things on the right, uh, the right data is very important. Okay, next up we have a very interesting presentation. I'm sure many people have questions for you, but we don't have time, too much time. So uh, you saw what she looked like, come up and, and, and speak with her afterwards. <laughs> um, next up, we have a very interesting presentation on uh, documentation for DHIS2 and how to use uh, um, some advanced uh, machine learning and or artificial intelligence to to enhance that uh, so i'd like to introduce eric from our tracker team yeah so i trust you all can uh, can hear me uh there has been three great speakers before me today uh they all mentioned chat gpt so you can probably guess what i'm going to talk about <laughs> Okay. Um, are you showing the screen? Yeah, I think I am. Yeah. <laughs> it should be at least. Hopefully, I'm not sharing to the other room now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. All right. All right. So, uh, for those of you who uh, don't know me, my name is uh, Eric. I'm a developer on the tracker. I'm part of the core development team here at the University of Oslo. 
Uh, in addition to being a developer, I'm also a uh, project lead where we use DHS to, to try to track uh, climate emissions for the private sector and businesses in Norway. So for the last uh, two and a half, uh, almost three years, uh, I've both developed and used DHS too. So I know your struggles, I know your pain points. Uh, today, I'm, I'm mostly going to talk about uh, LLMs or large language models that they're called. Uh, large language models itself, the term is pretty much unknown. Uh, you usually know it by ChatGPT or just GPT. But uh, before we, we go that far, we need to make sure that everyone's on board on what actually LLMs are. And I use the LLMs and not ChatGPT because there's multiple. Uh, it's not only OpenAI and there's much more to, to choose from. So what are LLMs? Uh, and LLMs are basically just huge, complex, advanced AI models. Uh, the same AI models that were so we're getting used to when we're scrolling our social media or uh, or buying products on Amazon. Uh, the only difference is that this AI model is trained on a lot of uh, conversational data. So it's trained on billions and billions of ba basically just text. And it sort of analyzes and it can actually get the context of the text that it's working on. And that is the revolutionary part compared to just having like an auto complete on your iPhone or whatever. So uh, I talked about ChatGPT and ChatGPT has gotten a lot of media attention in the, the last couple of months. Uh, usually it's painted this dark and gloomy sort of picture of how we are not connected anymore and uh, students don't teach anything. And, uh, and I brought two, two samples up here and, and this was just the last hour before making this presentation. So there's a lot of dark and gloomy stuff. And, and this, the first one is uh, uh, ChatGPT founder, Sam Altman, who was quoted on something that learning is going to be a bit different. I read the article and uh, they paint uh, this picture of students not having to learn anything, don't need to go to school. And of course, that's not the, that's not the reality. The other one is actually a pretty fancy one that, uh, that uh, was in Tech.no, which is a famous Norwegian uh, technology magazine. And it's uh, the very first all AI church service. And uh, you, you can see the screen up there. Uh, the reverend is, uh, is created by AI. The preacher was a 40 minute uh, preach, basically written by ChatGPT. And there were over 300 people attending that class. So almost as much as the annual conference itself. All right, uh, I've talked about uh, it trying to analyze and actually getting the, the context of the, the text that it's trying to analyze. And, and I'll give you a live demo on what we've done. We've tried to improve the, the documentation of DHS. Uh, before we go there, like show of hands, how many people have entered the docs of DHS in the last year? It's pretty many, it's pretty many. Uh, typical use cases just to, to do that is often like creating SEO content, like uh, content that's good for Twitter and, and Google and, and everything. It's writing essays and long text and also translating languages. We've taken a different approach and, and this is just like a brainchild of mine. It was very cold in Norway and a lot more cold than it is now. And the benefit of it being cold is that you get a lot of hours to tinker on your computer. Uh, and, and what we did is that we used GPT, or I did, we, I used GPT and tried to take the docs and splitting up. And I have some technical jargon that is not really important, but I'll, I'll try to show you what it, it really is. And uh, hopefully you can see it up here. Uh, so this is just a, a normal, uh, it's just using the GPT model, uh, and you can pretty much ask it anything related to, uh, to, to DHS. So we'll try what is a data element. And once you, you write it, we check this vector database in the backend, and we try to, to get the context of the user query, match it, and get the, the relevant context from the documentation and send it to OpenAI so they can rephrase it so it seems like it's a, it's a, a person, a personalized person trying to, to respond to your question. We can also, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Better? Okay, yeah. Okay. 
so we, we can also do this on more complex tasks. That's one of the benefits of using uh, uh, LLMs is that it can break down pretty uh, complex issues and, and, and give it to you in a format that's personalized for you. Uh, so uh, we can, there's been some people uh, talking about how to use R with DHS. Uh, and we can sort of tell it, can you give me five reasons to use R uh, with DHS? And we'll go through the documentation on how to use R, what is R, and we'll give you five good reasons, or at least five reasons. We can also uh, rephrase it, say that we want to print this thing and, uh, and actually show it. So we can say, uh, can you show me in a table? So you get the, in exact the format that you want to, to, to get it back. And this is of course using OpenAI, so it takes some time, but there you go. And it's back to showing you in a table that you can now dis display to others. Of course, this doesn't always make sense. So, uh, but it's more of the having the option to actually do it. Uh, another uh, thing about using uh, your own like separate application is that if we go to, to the open AI sites and we just use the, the GPT-3 and, and say I'm a, I'm a developer and I want to check out what are the new endpoints in the, in the tracker endpoints, which are no longer new, just a shameless plug that you should move on from the old ones. Uh, what are the new endpoints in tracker? And we'll ask GPT. I apologize. Of course, he doesn't know. He knows a lot about uh, DHS in general, but the new endpoints in, in Tracker is so new that it's not been trained on this data yet. So what should we do? Should we wait for the new GPT-5 or whatever to come out and, and actually be trained or should we provide it ourselves? Uh, so let's ask the same, same question here. What are the uh, new endpoints oh, in Tracker? Sorry for my spelling. And we'll try again and it analyzes the, the context of the question and hopefully it returns five new inputs. <laughs> Thank you. I'll also very, very quickly show you uh, how to uh, do some reporting and analyzing data through through GPT. I, I know not everyone likes to do it this way, but it's it's more to, to give you an idea of how easy it is to get started with these uh, kinds of things. So uh, I have a visualization in, uh, in the Data Visualizer app. Uh, it's, this is part of the Sierra Leone and it's basically just ANC3 coverage for the last 12 months. So. Uh, I choose the same visualization. I'll go down to uh, this one. I won't enter a custom prompt. I will just say generate a report from this data. And this is finalized data. And it gives you a report. And it starts off saying, what is the data? It just goes through uh, saying that this is data for the last 12 months. And it also is, it's, wants to give you a, a huge overview of all the data and everything. So it's pretty good, but it's not good enough. So how about if we do the same thing and we provide it a custom prompt, uh, let's say include a title, key insights and actionable points and generate. I see that I'm running out of time. So I'll just try to go through it. But here you have the same visualization. Uh, and the only thing that we pass in is basically what we get back from the API. We don't do any sanitations. Um, and here you have some key insights. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. Once again. I tried to read your lips, slash, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not good, that good. All right, so it, try, it tries to go through uh, and it says it's for the last 12 months from June 22 to May 23. And it says which district it's on and uh, the, the district wise performance, it tells you the, the minimum, the maximum and the average. And it also gives you some actionable points. Now say you're a district uh, facilitator or something. And suddenly you can get these actionable points that you can send out to all your facilities. And the actionable points is actually pretty good. You can 
let's see. This is, of course, live data, so I'm not really sure what it says back, but it's uh, monitoring performance, uh, investigate data quality issues. And it's not only just saying that you should investigate these kinds of things, but it's, it's saying that in Fujihun, a specific region, there's something that might be wrong. And this is not this is not replacing the great stuff that the people before me have talked about, but it's more of a giving an indication and really, really easy trying to see what can be done. So uh, these use cases are, of course, not viable. They're not ready for production. They're not ready for anything. But I'll just tell you this uh, to conclude everything. Um, if you were to make this app like the old school way, with just code, no AI, does anyone like to guess how long you would have taken? I can tell you now, this is under three hours of development. So it doesn't take a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of uh, effort. It's really simple to get started. I don't know the use cases, but I'll show you. And in true DHS fashion, I'm just expecting you guys to go wild with it. Yes. All right. I'll end there. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we are wrapping up now, so there'll be time for the coffee break here in a minute. Um, but I did want to touch on something that uh, a few people have, have said. I, I think Eric mentioned uh, uh, education in particular and people saying that AI is going to destroy learning, uh, but there's actually a pretty good talk recently by Sal Khan of the Khan Academy, who talks about that it's actually the opposite of that, right? This, uh, especially conversational uh, artificial intelligence can give everyone a personalized tutor, right? That understands their context and helps them to, to do their job or to, to learn something new. Uh, and helps them to to understand it better. So being able to kind of evaluate a, a visualization in DHIS2, but also being able to say, all right, with the, the configuration of my DHIS2 instance, how do I do this? That's something that if you have a thousand users, you would need a lot of people to be able to answer that question or to spend a lot of time training them. And so I think training documentation and uh, analytics of uh, things within the public health context and within DHS2 is a, a big area of opportunity for us. Thank you all for joining. And uh, we are, everybody is around if you want to continue to talk uh, AI and machine learning and uh, advanced analytics in the future. So thank you to the presenters again. <laughs>